Our final speaker this afternoon is Clive Downing. Um, Clive is working with the Scottish Government um, and has been a huge um, level of support to us in developing and hel helping to shape Community Broadband Scotland. Clive has a wealth of experience in supporting broadband projects in the north of England and we've definitely been picking his brains over the last year or so. Clive is going to take us through a presentation all about fibre solutions and I'll just hand over to Clive. Thank you. I've got to get some excuses in first. Um, I did this in a bit of a rush yesterday, so I'm going to commit the cardinal sin of presenting, of looking at the screen, thinking a bit, and then speaking. So if you bear with me. And the other um, thing to get out of the way is, I know there's some very clever technical people in the room with degrees and such forth. This isn't necessarily aimed at them. Um, and if I say anything badly, wrongly, technically, they can put me straight afterwards. Uh, this is what I tend to keep in mind, is particularly with all elements of, of community broadband projects. You can do anything technically, it's just how much it costs that's a problem. And as the man said, that's, that's probably fairly elementary, but if you keep that in mind as you go through things, um, it sort of puts things in, in perspective. So we're talking about fibre. That's good for you. It's not too technical. That's a traditional solution to an age-old problem. Okay. So what is fibre? People think fibre is, as being long filaments of glass or luckily plastic in tubes and there's some examples there. Um, this one, this one. Am I allowed to move that one up there? It's intended to be hung from poles. There's a support cable and then the fibre in the middle. Uh, that's a much used picture of little bits of light coming out of the fibre. But um, th that is pretty useless in itself. It's, it's an inanimate sort of thing. It's very long and thin. Um, it's more useful. Uh, it's not much use unless there's some equipment on the end of it. And um, what you do with it is, is sort of the sort of two main options. And Amanda talked earlier about the sort of fibre access project in Bagel, and that is talking about a whole fibre solution. I'm sort of dipping in and out of what you can do with fibre and, and what it really is in sort of in its most basic form. So um, assuming you have a piece of fibre going from one place to another, um, from perhaps from a back or point to somewhere near your network, um, you can do several things with it. You can put your own kit on the end. And that can be relatively cheap. You know, you, you can get some fairly cheap, good one gigabit fibre stuff that you put on the ends and it'll work fine. Um, and it gets faster, obviously, and as it gets faster, it's more expensive. Um, so there's now 100 gigabits per second ports coming out, fibre ports on, on switches and routers used deep in the internet. That costs an awful lot of money. Or you can rent the whole thing from a service provider as a fibre-based product. Now, pretty much in all the areas where we're talking about with communities, that, that provider is BT, and um, what, you're, what they're doing then, they have fibre in lots of places, and they have equipment on the end of it, so you haven't got to worry about that. They also put the equipment in fairly resilient places, telephone exchanges, which has got a good power supply, so it, you know, it hopefully shouldn't be switched off too often. But where you have a fibre which might have a, a throughput of, say, 40 gigs just as a fibre, they put the, uh, expensive equipment on the end, and they reduce that speed, and they charge you for doing that. So they typically they have... Um, three, you know, we're talking about BT Openreach, they have three main sort of fibre products, um, the smallest one being 10 meg, 100 meg, and, and the magic gigabit. Um, the thing that we like about fibre, it's very high capacity, it's fast, and um, it's also reliable. Once it's installed, it's fairly immune to most things. It's, the cables are well made, they you know, seal water out. Actually, it's not too affected by water, which is good. It's immune to electromagnetic interference, which sometimes affects wireless and you know, wireless stuff close together. And it's, it's future-proof. It tells it's future-proof, and actually it probably is. There's, there's nothing else coming along that, um, even though wireless kit has come on in leaps and bounds in terms of its capacity, you know, I don't hear a lot of coherent argument about fi you know, fibre not <coughs> being future-proof, so that, that's a good thing. But the things we don't like about it, um, there's not much of it about that's usable. There is... You know, you hear tales of fibre going up that road or down that road, or it's just at the bottom of the garden, but I can't tap into it. So it, that's not that helpful, really, is it? And the reason that there might well be fibre there, and it could be there, you know, it might be there 20 years, it might be part of an old you know, traffic light control system, or it might be part of some old comms network. Um, the problem is, if it's there, is getting into it and using it. Say, so if, if you get close to it, you have to have some fairly expensive kit in a some sort of housing, a cabinet or even a small building, you have to have a power supply to it. So the fact that it's sort of going up, you know, through the village in some way, it's not that easy to dig into. 
um, because it's expensive. We talked about that. It's expensive to install, and this is, you know, if there's no fibre there, um, your average fibre can be anything between 20 pence and a pound a metre, you know, with a reasonable number of uh, glass pairs in it, the actual bits that transmit the data. Um, but that's got to go somewhere. Um, the first slide had some fibre with a catenary wire on it that you can suspend from poles, which is great if you have poles to suspend them from. Um, if you don't, you're probably having to dig it into the ground in some way. Um, in community... Um, in community communities, I was going to say that's not really in community areas. Basically, where you have access to ground and access to people who dig it up fairly cheaply, that their cost can be reduced. But even so, you know, you're talking about some expensive civil works. If you have to dig a, a trench of even a kilometre long, it's it's not going to be cheap. Um, and as I said, said a couple of times now, the, you need to house the equipment somewhere at the end of the fibres. So wireless stuff, by nature, it tends to be more outdoor proof. So you can stick it up on a mast or on a building, and it's it's sort of self-contained and waterproof. Uh, there's no self-contained waterproof sort of fibre terminating kit. You know you have to put it somewhere. So all this comes about is that fibre is good, but if it's deployed commercially, it'll only go where there's a high return on that investment, where that that cost, the high cost of putting it in, uh, can be can come back to the to whoever's investing it in the, in the first place. So in core networks, the sort of big networks that run up and down the country, it's pretty universal. Um, in some remote areas, the cores are still, still sort of high-capacity wireless. But, you know, it's fairly true to say, if you've got a core network, it will be fibre-based and high speed. Um, it's often used in backhaul now. Um, backhaul is where, and I know a lot of people know what backhaul is, but in case there's the one person who doesn't, it's where you're taking all the internet traffic from your access, from your community, back towards the internet. Um, there's a lot of you know, backhaul used in commercial um, broadband rollouts to, to connect the end users, the group of end users, back to the, to the core, except in rural and remote areas where wireless is still relied on in, in a lot of places. Um, and it's used in, in access where, where the investment can be made. And you know, that's what um, Bagler sort of wrangling with at the minute, the fundraising for that. Um, now, I'll put where the investment can be made, not where the money can be raised, because depending on where the investment comes from, if you have a rare, fairly patient investor, even though the cost might be high, the lifetime of fibre is fairly long, so you have time to recoup that cost. So it's more around the, the appetite of the investor to wait patiently for the, the return than uh, perhaps more commercial investment, like a, a bank who so just wants the money back within a couple of years with interest, and uh, where you're not really likely to get that return. But... Um, I've also been avoiding PON, passive optical networks. I'm not talking about, but I've mentioned it because um, it's, it's a, a popular use of, of fibre in the access layer. And, and BT's fibre on demand of BT fibre, the premise product is PON, passive optical networks. But I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think anyone's here is thinking about installing a PON network. So mm -hmm. apart from Fergus there, uh, who was. Well, tell me about it afterwards, that would be really good. Okay. So how does it work with community? I mean, Talk about future proofness, the more fibre the better. You know, I, I don't you can't argue that. Whether it's possible or not is another thing. I'm not saying that uh, you know it's fibre's the only way. And there are very worthy and and good wireless solutions. It's all about what can cost in. But this presentation is really more about where you can tactically use fibre in what might be primarily wireless networks. Um, so you probably won't have a call because we're not in that business of operating core networks, shifting huge amounts of data around the country. Uh, but we probably need some backhaul, and it's really good for backhaul. And it's equally good when it's part of a, you know, it can be equally good with a high-capacity wireless solution. So at some point, if you're all wireless at the access, wireless are part of your backhaul, at some point you will go back to fibre to get back to the internet. And where that happens is really down to where the backhaul is and how you can cost it in getting your wireless back to it, if that makes sense. Uh, and it's great for access if you can afford it, as we've, we've talked about. So, assume you have a, a wireless access network. This is like delving into the backhaul thing at the minute. Um, adding fiber backhaul will make it fly, um, hence the bird. Um, so, where, where can you get fiber from? Well, what can you afford? I mean, you can dig your own, and that's the cheapest way of doing it, but it's quite a lot of work, and it's a lot of planning. Um, and it depends on the nature of your community and who owns what land and what whaleys you'll need and whether you can get people to help you 
dig, dig holes in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, or you can rent it from a communications provider. And actually, in, in the areas where we're all sort of operating, BT is probably the only uh, game in town. Uh, uh, you know, Virgin Media Territory is not typical community broadband territory. Um, or you can share it with someone else. Now, this is key, I think, and then th this is a big challenge for CBS and the Scottish Government guys um, in that the public sector has lots of places where it has to provide connectivity. And we're thinking schools, universities, um, hospitals, whatever, any public sector site, which will have fibre. Um, we're particularly interested in schools because lots of... So the last bastion of community is normally primary schools, but the last bastion of the public sector. And um, sorry, what do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I was just, I was just going to ask you about SSE because they've got lots of glass around. They have. Um, I'd class them as the commercial side of things, though. But uh, indeed, they do. And uh, we're trying to find out where it is 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 a, is a trick as well. But they, they do. But um, BT, though, I mean, the reason I put BT up there, uh, they. They have a productized, regulated price list, which is available to everybody. And we'll get on to that in a bit. Nobody should be paying retail. Sorry? Nobody should be paying retail. Indeed. And now we're talking about BT OpenReach here, so, yeah. No, but you shouldn't be paying retail price lists, is what I'm saying. Fair enough. So, you know, sharing with somebody else, but it, it's part of that, from a, from a community challenge, is knowing where this might be. And there's a lot of work going on in CBS, and, and with particularly Robbie, who's gone now, but in, in, in the government to try and sort of locate where these things can happen. And equally importantly, or perhaps more importantly, try and work out a way where the, it can be legally procured and used for, for community use. Because that's the big challenge at the minute, that there's this um, sort of um, spectre of state aid that gets bandied around every time somebody wants to share something. But that, that's a challenge, but probably not specific to fibre technology, more specific to the use of, of shared backhaul with the public sector. So where from is a the question then. You know, it's great if you can um, you can get hold back on and fibre back on, but where where do you get that from? So commercial operators' points of presence, the POP. Um, again, in in the sort of more traditional community areas, there's not a huge amount of them about. There's loads of POPs in London or Manchester, or even even Edinburgh and Glasgow, but very few appear. Now, I don't know if we've heard about it before I came today, but. You know, there are two large procurements going on with the Scottish Government which will actually drive out more, more coverage, more fibre coverage, hence more points of presence from, you know, from BT. So that, that's a good thing. Uh, uh, what form will these points, I was, uh, I'm sorry, I've been trying to get for a little while. Yeah. Uh, with these procurements, what form will these POPs take exactly? They should be the standard regulate. They'll be telephone exchanges, won't they? Or they, you know, the right, standard so, regulated so, BT so open reach handover points. The point. barrier to sticking equipment in one of BT's exchanges is really high, cost-wise, indeed. But there, there are there are possibly cheaper ways of doing that. But we're t I'm talking about you know commercial operators points of presence, which are exchanges, and I absolutely readily admit they have a cost to them, um, which has to be met by somebody. Did I just interject? The questions are kept to the end, so if we can get a microphone. It will just help with uh, the proceedings today and let Clive just carry on okay, to the end of the right presentation. Up. But we will have time for questions at the end. Fair enough. Thank you, Sandra. I'm going to carry on. <laughs> um, so you might find a local business who has a fibre connection. Um, people, um, you know, anyone, business nowadays want to save money. So if there is a local business which either has a fibre connection, which might share with you, or wants to buy one and might share the cost of getting that fibre in, let share with you, that help reduce the cost for everybody. Now, I'm talking in very sort of broad solutions here that, you know, you all come from all different communities all over the country and you will know who does what, um, whether it's, there might be a landowner with an office that has a fibre in that it can share. It, that is the key community engagement element. That's where, you know, any support we can give from CBS really can only back up what you know about your individual communities. Or, as I've mentioned, a public sector site, which is, again, is this work in progress. Um, I'm just, I keep stressing it's a work in progress because at the minute it's not, it's not legally possible to, to rock up at a site and say, you know, we want to share your ball. Even if everyone's willing, there are, there's possibilities of challenge to that. So that's where I'm a bit careful about it. So you, get, you can get a price on BT Openreach, which I was about. So you have all the broadband ingredients but sadly no cake. 
So basically, BT OpenReach own lots of bits and pieces, but what they're not allowed to do is provide solutions. They can't provide a whole um, network for you to use. Um, so if you, you know, if you probably should explore the cost of getting uh, a BT connection into where you are, and you can do that just by um, looking up at a, a project they call Ethernet Access Direct EAD. And that comes in various um, speeds, and being regulated by Ofcom, it also is distance regulated. That's because BT don't want you to use it to make core networks. It's supposed to be an access product. Uh, now, the problem with that is a 30, 25 kilometer or a 35 kilometer is great if you live in Essex. You can get to lots of places. It's not great out here, and that's that's traditionally been the problem. And and the uh, the aspiration is, uh, you know, further to Will's question of wh where these points of presence will be, the fibre rollouts, you know, the, the broadband rollouts that are being procured at the minute, being procured by high, being planned by high at the minute, and by the rest of Scotland, will increase the number of these points of presence. Um, the sticking point there is we're not sure when yet because BT are doing all their planning and they'll be you know, developing and revealing their plans as, as that happens. But you can use it. But you'll also have to find other ingredients. All these do is they're pretty much, uh, I don't know if you're aware of a, a LAN, a local area network, so you, you might have um, in your house, you know, plug in downstairs and plug it upstairs. They do the same thing. They're, they're two ports except they're miles apart, so they, they just take a big distance out of the, the whole equation. You can get a price on the OpenReach website at that URL. You can put in your postcodes where you want to be, and they'll give you a price. The, the warning, though, is it's subject to survey, because you look at the BT price list, and the actual installation price is, you know, if you look at depending on the product, but it could be £1,200, you think, oh, that's not bad, you know, £1,200 for installed fibre. Great. The problem is, they'll, if you order that, they'll come and do a survey. And then for all the bits that don't exist, the ducts, the, the fibers, even some poles, they add that to the installation price. And that's when it gets really expensive. Um, but it's a rental, that's a key thing. What we're about here is basically helping communities with that initial start, but we cannot help them with ongoing you know, grants just to keep the thing going. So depending on the rental, it may, and depending on the amount of income you're getting from your community, depend on whether that's an affordable option. Just picked about sharing the fibre. This was, um, we've done quite a bit of this in North Yorkshire. Um, now North Yorkshire actually went and got a specific state aid approval to actually do this, which is very helpful. Um, it takes a lot of uncertainty out of the, you know, the whole thing. If, if you know that what you're doing, it, can, it might not be shut down. Um, so but that's sharing with a business. Um, you need something called uh, an MPLS cloud. You need the ability to create a VPN to share the same fiber. So they're absolutely discrete in terms of, you know, it'd it almost be the same as separate fibers in, in terms of security and engineering um, certainty that you, you know, you'll get your share. Um, typically that will go to a host building. Could be the business, could be the, the local school. And typically, and we are talking typically because not, not every scenario is the same, that then goes in some, some line of sight wireless up to the community in some way. It might be several hops. Um, as Will will tell you, wireless can do all sorts of great things nowadays. And uh, with some relatively cheap kits, you can go a relatively long way. Or you can dig it yourself. Um, the, the barn people are doing that, they're digging it themselves. Um, Again, that that's, depends on what you want to do as a community and how you, what capacity you have in the community to, to actually you know, plan and manage that sort of thing. Um, I guess you can dig up your own lawn if you want to as well, because basically that, the picture on the left shows you know, the, the sort of network going around between the villages. What will happen typically then is it will go past um, the front or back door of, of premises, and when you want to... Uh, to use it, um, you dig it into your house. Um, that guy's very precious about his lawn, obviously, he's, he's put uh, mats down. The, the box at the bottom is um, a fibre splicer, and although fibre is fairly high tech, you can, you know, within a community, build the resources to actually learn how to do that fibre splicing yourself, again, saving, saving money. But 
that option uh, is not faint-hearted, Amanda. I think that, uh, <laughs> this is probably getting to the end of it now. In terms of um, th this was brought to bear particularly at the, at the Use Valley surveys. We, what we've talked, I've talked so far about going from a core network through fibre to wireless. It's also perfectly feasible to go from wireless to fibre, and that's quite useful where you've got awkward things to get round. Now, if you're going over a hill to another community of 40 houses, it's probably worth putting a mast or two on the top to leap over the top. But if there's only one or two houses out there, actually that, that's going to be, that's going to be ex expensive. It might be cheaper uh, to lay some fibre, especially if you have access to the ground, you know, from, from your nearest wi wireless point, through the trees in that instance. I think my fibre flashes, I'm very proud of that. They're, um, through the trees in that, that could equally be a windy valley. And um, in the used valley when we did the surveys, there's a few houses um, which were just round the bend. And one, one house, you know, you could just almost get to it, but, you know, it would meant another mast on the shoulder of a hill, and that would have meant getting power to the mast or a wind generation or solar panels. So it actually would cost in, if, if the community would dig it themselves, 500 metres of fibre is relatively cheap, and that's the solution for that house. But again, it, that's just a very practical um, tactical solution. So actually, I actually did put something about access in it. It's a it's a rare form of community project, and it's actually it's future proof. I don't know why I put the word relatively there, but um, if you've got five or two on house, it's future proof. Um, and again, we, I think we've talked about barn, and certainly uh, Amanda talked about bagel. Um, that really wasn't the point of my uh, presentation. So, and that is the end. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Clive. Now, I have a feeling there'll be quite a few questions, but could I ask to start with that we just take questions from community groups, just to give them a chance to ask um, any questions that they may have. So if we just open the floor just now to folk representing the communities. Okay. You've had your chance. <laughs> okay, we'll open it wider and we'll just take a couple of questions from the whole floor. Any yeah. questions? Do you have a question? Well, um, wearing my community hat. Yeah. Um, uh, Fergus from Balquidder Community Broadband. Um, the, the, the real problem getting into exchanges is that they're not unbundled. If, you, if they're not unbundled, you can't get in, and then it doesn't matter how cheap or expensive they are because they're not letting that's you in the door. Fair, that's a fair point. Um, um, again, the rollout will determine you know, where, where more open reach hand handover points and unbundled exchanges will be created. Um, the, actually, what I didn't mention, the, another practical use of fibre, and I haven't got a slide for it, <coughs> such as why I, I forgot about it, is that where there is fibre to the cabinet rollout, BT will also have a, project, a product called uh, Fibre on Demand. So if, if uh, as, a, as a result of, of these expanded networks, or even BT's existing commercial networks, you get a cabinet which is fibre on it, you then have a, a BT product, uh, which is subject to the same survey rules, that tends to push out more into rural areas where potentially you get fibre back up. Now that is a pond solution, but their their sort of their top current pond product is 330 megabits down and 30 megabits up, which for a community is a you know is a, a big uplift on perhaps a, a DSL type uh, back up. Um, based on data I've seen from GigaClear, that's 50% uh, more the bandwidth than they get in a, in a typical village installation being used. They, they get a quarter of a gig, a uh, uh, 250 meg right. is, is their... What the village uh, is, is, is what the village is, because everything, right. uh, although there's lots of people using it, yeah. everything's so quick, it's okay. they, they're not using it for very long. So that'd be good then, you're saying? So that, 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 would, be, that would be ample, good. yeah. 